Continental Illinois Bank was the seventh biggest bank in the U.S. before going to the bankruptcy in 1984. What analysts said did not go into occur, did occur. But let's go to the beginning. Let's talk about history. Continental Illinois Bank and Trust Company was founded in 1929. It was the result of the union of Continental National Bank and Trust Company plus Illinois Merchant Trust Company. The first one was born in 1910 through the fusion of the Commercial Bank and Continental National Bank. In 1913, it merged with the Iberian Banking Association. The Illinois Merchants Trust Company, in 1923, Merchants Law and Trust merged with the Illinois Trust and Service Bank. In 1924, they were joined by the Core Exchange National Bank to form Illinois Merchants Trust Company. Finally, in 1932, they founded Continental Illinois National Bank and Trust Company. Under the control of the President Cummings during World War II and immediately after, Continental remained a caution, low profit bank. Its lending policies were an adventure and it relied heavily on its large bond portfolio for revenue. In 1959, Cummings retired and was replaced by David Kennedy. He transformed a high bond, hyper conservative bank into one of the most dynamic and progressive forces in American banking. Under Kennedy, expanding its international activities, opening a branch in London and acquiring branches in Tokyo and Osaka. Continental had a presence in much of Europe and Latin America. Kennedy encouraged his loan officers to think about more growth and less about risk. However, his expansionist policies as a practice by his successor also set the stage for Continental's downfall. Having a look to indicators of the financial conditions, Continental Bank was doing good. Average return on equity was 14.35%, the second largest in the country, and the return on average assets was being acceptable. Between 1976 and 1981, Continental's total assets grew from $21 billion to $45 billion, while Continental's lending grew from $5 billion to $15 billion. However, there are indicators about the risk they were taking, as the assets increased dramatically from 57.9% to the 68.8% or the continental return on asset was okay, but they were originating loans with lower interest rates. Given the large increase in interest rates over the period, the bank adopted a below market pricing strategy. Continental's lending style was becoming very aggressive. Some newspapers said that Continental was willing to do anything to make a deal, taking more risk in selected areas. One of those areas was, for example, the energy sector. They also got an aggressive pricing. For example, when doing business with companies badly enough, they offered cheap deals. Let's move to Continental's growth. The bank had a conservative roots before the 70s, but after, during the 70s, management implemented a rapid growth strategy focused on commercial lendings. By 1981, Continental was the largest commercial bank and industrial lender in the US. Now we're going to talk about the comparison data. We are going to show you a board about the performance measures for Continental Illinois Corporation compared to other multinational banks from 1976 to 1993. Uh, firstly, we're going to talk about the profitability ratios. The ratios analyze a return on equity capital and return on assets. An analysis of the multinational and regional data reveals that Continental's return on equity capital for the period 1976 to 1981 was high and very stable averaging 40.31%, almost 2% points above its multinational peer group. This high return on equity capital is a result of, continent, of continued improvement in net income due primarily to a significant increase in interest and fee income for an increasing volume of loans. In 1982 and 1983, the extremely low return was due primarily to a significant increase in the provision for loan cost expenses, a direct result of Penn Square's failure and the bankrupt 
a near bankrupt of several of the bank's large Midwest and manufacturing corporate borrowers. According to return of assets, they are designed to indicate the effectiveness of management in employing its available resources. An analysis of both the multinational and regional data reveals that continental return on assets for the period 1976 to 1981 was high and very stable. This high return on assets is due primarily to the continued increase in the dollar level of domestic and foreign earned assets. Also, the banks uh, challenge a large amount of funds traditionally held in the form of short-term money market investments into loans offering high layers but less liquidity. In 1982 and 1983, Continental's return was 0.18 and 0.26 percent respectively. This was 0.31 and 0.26 percent points below the average of its multinational and regional per groups, respectively. The analysis of assets quality is particularly important to institutions which assume both a credit and an interest rate risk on their ACEs. The ACEs quality ratios analyzed are net charge of to long loans, allowance for possible loans losses to total loans, and non-performing assets to total assets. The assets quality ratios of the multinational and regional peer groups reveal the following. Continental ratio of allowance for possible loan loss to total loans was as much as 0.09 and 0.25 percentage points below the average for the peer groups. Continental's ratio of net change of to total loans was consistently below its peers, averaging 0.29% as compared to the peer group's average. Finally, the bank's ratio of non-performing assets averaged 1.3, just slightly above the multinational peer group. During 1982 and 1983, Continental experienced a several deterioration in its asset quality ratios as compared to the multinational peer group. The banking's allowance for possible loan losses to total loans increased significantly from 0.89% in 1981 to 1.50 and 1.2% in 1982 and 1983 respectively. The bank's net charge of to total loans increased dramatically from a low of 0.29% in 1981 to 1.28% and 1.37% in 1982 and 1983. Finally, Continental's ratio of non-performing assets to total uh, assets also increased uh, dramatically from an average from 1.3 uh, in 1979 to, uh, to 1981 to 4.6% in 1982 and 1983. According to capital adequacy, the capital ratios analyzed are equity capital to total assets and equity capital to total loans. This analysis reveals that continental equity capital to total assets ratios were relatively constant for the period. Equity capital to total loans also indicates uh, the percentage decline in assets that could be covered with equity capital. From 1976 to 1982, uh, reveals that continental level of equity capital over the period did not keep place in relation to the extremely high volume of loan and asset growth. As a result, the below average base that exists in 1966 continued to erode. However, in 1982 and 1983, then the quality of continental assets was determined to be poor and the urine of those assets were depressed, the risk of insolvency significant increase. The two liquidity ratios analyzed are liquid assets and total assets. In related to total assets, the analysis reveals that Continental's loans continue to increase. In general, this ratio reveals the existence of a poor liquidity position, which indicates the need to further evaluate other liquid ratios. Related to liquid assets and the minus volatile liabilities to total assets, the analysis reveals that our analysis of the period from 1976 to 1983 reveals that Continental was increasing its assets with heavy loan volume and has to finance them with more volatile and more expensive money. Finally, we have the growth. The three ratios analyzed are growth in loans, growth in assets, and growth in earnings. Analysis of these ratios from 1977 to 1981 reveals a steady growth in earnings average for 
40.8%. This consistently evens growth mandated by continental's management was driven by 16.4% steel growth average in assets with was maintained by a significant growth in loans average 19.9%. During this period, Continental outperformed its multinational peers in both assets on long growth by 3.4 and 5.2 percent points, respectively. However, the growth in Iris consisted strong by management was as much as 3.7 percent points below its peer group. In 1982 and 1983, the strong and stable growth trends were eliminated. By mid to late 1982, significant concern centered to the quality of Continental's assets. This caused management to take a strongly cautious approach and increase additional loans. Also, a number of loans were classified as non-performing and were brightened enough. As a result, earnings from interest and fees on loans were severely depressed. Our analysis confirmed an increase in the growth of loans, assets and earnings for Continental during the period 1976 to 1993. Coming to this point, we will analyze the bankruptcy. Late in 1981, problems started to surface. The bank's second quarter earnings fell 12%, while Continental's corporate customers began to have some problems. For example, Newcomb Energy lost $40 million and Continental held large portion of this debt. In addition, Continental lent $200 million to the near bankrupt of International Harvest. Continental's share price declining 37%, but analysts said that it was more because of psychological reasons than fundamental reasons. The bankruptcy of the continental Illinois are based on three basically reasons connected to each other. Lending officers were encouraged to move fast, offer more innovative packages and take more loans without thinking about the risk of the operation. Continental became particularly aggressive in the energy area mainly in oil and gas loans. From 1970, this sector was hit by a deep global crisis because of the many wars and the Continental had a lot of investment and loan with the energy industry. That was a big problem. The optimism about Continental Bank ended in 1982 when the Penn Square Bank failed. The correlation with the Penn Square Bank played an important role on the balance of the Continental Bank. The Penn Square Bank collapsed due to the fact of investments on the energy sector as well. Continental had to declare that $1.3 billion non-performing assets in the second quarter of 1982. The second reason is represented by the loan given to the less developed Latin American countries. The most important example is the government of Mexico that couldn't pay the debts to the continental Illinois after the collapse of Penn Square Bank. The last reason is represented by the problem of liquidity. Analysts changed their mind and they started to say that continental Illinois had much risk in its credit portfolio and they gambled. After these developments, investors and depositors thought that continental Illinois would be in a bankrupt in the long term, so they began to withdraw their deposits. Continental Illinois Bank failed in 1984. It was the largest bank failure in U.S. history. This forced regulators to act. Uh, and the whole thing started with that Continental Illinois borrowed $3.6 billion from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, which acts as a lender of last resort. Uh, on May 14, uh, Continental Illinois received a 4.5 billion line of credit that had been arranged over the weekend from 16 of the nation's largest banks. The bank run continued, however, and regulators feared that the problems would spill over to other banks. The FDIC, which is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, estimated that uh, nearly 2,300 banks had invested in Continental Illinois. Uh, 179 of those banks had invested amounts equal 
to more than half of their equity capital. The Federal Reserve also expressed concerns about spillovers in its monetary policy, meaning that May, the Fed, wanted tighter monetary policy, but chairman Paul Volcker said Continental Illinois had taken that option off the table. The fear of spillovers led regulators to extend unusual support to Continental Illinois. On May 17, the FDIC announced a 1.5 billion capital infusion into the bank. Most controversially, on May 18, the FDIC announced that it would extend support to creditors not normally protected from a bank's failure. Uh, then on uh, July 26, 1984, after an unsuccessful search for a buyer for the bank, the FDIC announced that it would prevent the bank's failure by providing permanent assistance. The FDIC committed to purchasing up to 4.5 billion in bad loans from the bank and in the end the FDIC protected all bondholders and depositors from the bank's insolvency. However, holders of stocks were largely wiped out. Continental Illinois continued to function uh, under prime primarily government ownership until the government exited its stake in 1991 and the bank was purchased by Bank of America in 1994. Uh, however, it is important to remember that the Fed was not technically involved in the rescue beyond its, uh, beyond its discount window lending. Uh, the Federal Reserve was only actively involved in discussing with the FDIC, the Treasury and other regulators on how to handle the situation. Continental Alunis' failure raised questions about how regulators should deal with failing banks. At the time, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation had three options. The first one was to liquidate the bank and pay insured depositors. The second one was arranged for another institution to purchase the bank. This option often had the effect of protecting uninsured depositors. Finally, the third one is keep the bank alive with Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation funds. That will protect all the bank's creditors.